Hello ladies, gents, and everyone's. It is Monday, May 1st, and we're here to talk about this month's space and astronomy news. April is the month of Earth Day, and I hope you took a second to appreciate this wonderful planet that we live on. And one of the things that is so cool about Earth is our robust magnetic field. This not only protects our atmosphere, but has the wonderful side benefit of having these beautiful aurorae, which have actually been especially bright over the past couple of weeks, thanks to some extra strength solar activity. I hope some of you got to see them. I've actually never seen any aurorae, and I live in LA, so I don't really see very much of the night sky at all. <laughs> the other terrestrial planets, Mercury, Mars, and Venus, they do not have strong magnetic fields. But what about terrestrial exoplanets? Do they have magnetic fields and how would we even know? Well, one way that has been proposed to potentially detect exoplanet magnetic fields are something called star-planet interactions, or SPIs, and these can produce detectable bursts of coherent radio emission. And those proposed signals have been detected, possibly, in the star YZ SETI meaning that the terrestrial planet YZ SETI B might have a magnetic field. Now, more data is needed to rule out some other possible explanations for these signals, but this is the first candidate we have for a terrestrial exoplanet with magnetic field, and it's really exciting to think that there are other rocky exoplanets with magnetic fields out there in our galaxy. Although, just to be clear, YZ SETI B is too hot to support life as far as we know, so it's not Earth-like in that sense. One of my favorite Hubble images, actually just one of my favorite images at all ever, period, is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, and I know I'm far from alone in this. So it's really exciting that JWST has revisited the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. JWST observed this area back in October, and a preliminary image was released in April. Webb was able to get to the same depth in this field in less than a day. It took Hubble almost 12 days which is not only amazingly fast, but with its sensitivity to infrared light, Webb revealed new information about these galaxies to astronomers and uncovered some new galaxies. Looking at images like this just makes me feel like I could just fall right into the universe, and I love this joining of awe and science. Exciting news from ESA last month, its latest large-scale mission and its first ever Jupiter mission launched successfully on April 14th after a one-day delay due to weather. I'm talking, of course, about JUICE. One point to note here is that if you've been following JUICE over the years, then you probably know that it's an acronym for Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, or I should say it was. The mission's name has been tweaked and is now just JUICE, though it still is the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer. So I guess really the only thing that changed here is that it's not in all caps anymore. <laughs> JUICE launched on an Ariane 5 rocket from the ESA spaceport in French Guiana, and the launch went off beautifully and the solar array is deployed successfully. We even got this selfie from the spacecraft. Love it. However, it hasn't all been smooth sailing, as one of JUICE's 10 instruments, the Ryan antenna, hasn't been deploying as planned. The antenna hasn't fully released from its mounting bracket, and it's only about a third of the way deployed. ESA thinks the cause is a small pin that is just barely stuck, and they are currently executing plans to help successfully dislodge this pin and get the antenna deployed. They remain optimistic that it will happen successfully before the two-month commissioning period is over. JUICE is en route to Jupiter, a journey that will take about eight years, and once it gets there, it will become the first ever mission to be in orbit around the moon of another planet. Congrats to ESA and good luck to JUICE. Another exciting launch from April was the first ever integrated test of the SpaceX Starship with Super Heavy, the largest and most powerful rocket ever built. Super Heavy is not an exaggeration. This thing is powered by 33 Raptor engines, and it can produce almost 75 million newtons of thrust. For comparison, that's twice what the iconic Saturn V rocket was capable of. SpaceX plans for this to be the first ever fully reusable rocket. That's both first and second stage. The Falcon 9 only has a reusable first stage. And they plan to use Starship for future NASA moon missions as well as their own Mars missions. So it was really exciting to see this behemoth stacked and ready to go on the launch pad in Boca Chica. The test was planned for Monday, April 17th, but there was a frozen valve that caused an issue and they had to postpone the test until Thursday, April 20th, but then it did in fact launch. So the fact that the rocket got clear of the launch pad and achieved an altitude of 39 kilometers makes this test a definite success. However, it was not as successful as it could have been. Up to eight of the Raptor engines failed, and about three minutes into the flight, the rocket entered this uncontrolled tumble, and eventually it exploded thanks to the flight termination system. 
or I should say, experienced a rapid unscheduled disassembly. <laughs> As expected for any failed launch, the FAA is now conducting a mishap investigation, including looking into why the debris from the termination was spread over a much larger area than expected. The launch itself, with all of those rockets, caused extensive damage to the launch pad, so that is undergoing repairs and upgrades right now. But SpaceX thinks that it could be ready to test again in as soon as two months. There was a solar eclipse over Australia on April 20th, and such an event is cool enough to begin with, but this one was actually a very rare type of solar eclipse called a hybrid solar eclipse. So a total solar eclipse is when the sun is completely blocked by the moon. By the way, this is the only type of eclipse that it's safe to look at without glasses. There's also something called an annular solar eclipse, where the moon doesn't quite block out the entire sun, so there's still a little ring of light or an annulus that is visible. And this eclipse? It combined both types. And if you're thinking, how is that even possible? Because that's what I thought when I heard this. It's because of the curvature of the Earth, which slightly changes the relative distances. And so it means at different points along the path of the eclipse, depending on where the sun and moon are in the sky, you actually get a different kind of eclipse. And this image of the eclipse was captured by NASA's Discover satellite. And I just absolutely love this perspective of the solar eclipse and how it's just the shadow of the moon falling on the Earth. The past few years have seen a really big growth in private space missions, including a really exciting mission from the Japanese company iSpace. The Hakuto R mission launched back in December and was aiming to be the first ever successful private lunar landing. The lander carried a UAE rover, a JAXA robot, and a camera system from a private Canadian company and was hoping to do some science on the soil of the moon. Unfortunately, although it was able to successfully reach lunar orbit, the landing attempt on April 25th was not successful. Contact was lost with the mission and it crashed on the lunar surface. The lander seems to have been in the correct vertical position going into the landing. However, it ran out of the propellant that was needed to slow its descent. And it's an unfortunate loss and a reminder that space activity, even today, is still a complicated and difficult endeavor. But iSpace is not deterred and they're still continuing with plans for future missions. NASA astronauts and Russian cosmonauts, among others, have been continuously occupying the International Space Station for over 22 years. However, given recent deteriorating relations with Russia, thanks to its invasion of Ukraine, the future of this partnership has been unclear. Last year, Moscow said that it would not support operations on the station past the end of the current agreement in 2024, even though the US and other partners had already committed to extending to 2030. And although that statement in particular was retracted, it was still not certain if they were going to sign on to a new agreement or not. But NASA said last Thursday that Russia has indeed committed to extending ISS operations through 2028. Given that the station was intentionally designed so that it could not be operated without the cooperation of the partnership, this is very good news for the ISS. This unusual feature in a Hubble image was first thought to be just an imaging artifact. However, when a team of astronomers attempted to remove the artifact using their typical methods, it was not what they expected, and so they decided to follow up. And what they found was evidence for a never-before-seen phenomenon, a runaway supermassive black hole ejected from its host galaxy by interactions with other supermassive black holes, and this line was the trail of its passage through the galaxy. Basically, where the black hole passed, it disturbed the gas, triggering new star formation, and that is what we are seeing in the line. This is a really neat hypothesis, and it definitely really captured imaginations last month, and it got a fair amount of press coverage. However, not everyone is convinced. Another team of astronomers put out a rebuttal last week saying that this structure is actually not consistent with what you would likely expect from such a runaway supermassive black hole. Instead, they claim that it's more consistent with a more common object, a very thin galaxy seen edge on. This is science in action, folks! <laughs> we'll just have to wait and see which hypothesis stands up to follow up data and modeling. Well, that's it for April. What a month! Thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you again in June for the May news. That makes sense. <laughs> Have a good one. Bye!